Hi! <laughs> Coming up in this episode, Ryan speaks too long. Martin, wait, I, oh, I gotta do it again. I gotta do it again. <laughs> Coming up in this episode of the Inkscape Inkscope podcast, Ryan talks too long. Tim is charming as always, and Martin wears a hat. This is this is the top of the show, right? People have just yes. switched on, and we're yep. telling them what this show is, and then it'll cut to Ryan doing his bit that he's just done. <laughs> okay, so what? So first of all, let me get it clear in my head. What is this show? <laughs> Inkscope. <laughs> Inkscope. It's Inkscope. Okay, so uh, welcome to Inkscope. This is a show about Inkscape. Uh, we're going to talk about Inkscape, its development, uh, its community, and hopefully what's going to be ha happening in the future so you can get an idea of um, where we're going to go with the Inkscape pro project. Perfect. That was much more professional than mine. That, that was much better than I was going to do. Um, you can always cut things out, but you can't add things back in. I'm recording like, now. Like, like, what Martin, <laughs> like what Martin said about, you know, everyone kind of feeling, nobody feels necessarily that they're part of the core team. Like, that's cool. I, I mean, that's kind of a neat statement. Yeah, yeah, I've never thought yeah, you of know. it like that. I mean, I, I must admit, I I feel like that because I don't do any of that tippy-tappy stuff on the keyboard. Don't know any of that stuff. And for me, I always feel as though I'm on the outside looking in. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, um, you guys probably don't see me in that light, but like Martin was saying just now, we all feel as though we're on the outside looking in you know and and for him to say that he and tav have that opinion that's like crazy to me because you are the people that i consider to be the core of the inkscape project so to hear you saying that you feel on the outside is is crazy well, we, this is why this is why we've always had a, a community management um policy I, I think it's actually written down somewhere but i don't quote, quote me on it where we actually say that um we have to be able to invite and give permission to people, uh, even if we don't feel like we're the, we have the authority to give permission, right? So, so, so somebody comes to us and says, hey, I, I want to do something for Inkscape. I want to make a piece of artwork or code or whatever it is. Um, part of uh, the, the job as the community management almost really is to be able to say, yes, absolutely. You have permission. You have my permission for whatever that's worth. Uh, to go ahead and do that thing, code or, or, or art or, you know, there are, of course, limits about represent, representing Inkscape itself and its trademark and all the legal stuff. But beyond that, Inkscape is a very open team. So um, it's nice to be able to invite new me members in and, and be open uh, to their, not just their work, but also their, their um, opinions and what they want to do. Yeah, that's that's really interesting because that's the sort of thing that, in the community we don't get to hear or understand and so i think a lot of people hold back from joining in because they don't realize that they can join in and i think yeah. that's something that you know um hopefully vectors can help sort out and as we were talking about before you came on uh, ryan and myself were talking we do need to find an easy way to pull people in and buddy system them and and show them ropes and say hey you know it's okay to run with a project it's okay to ask for help you know yeah. take it run with it and be confident that you're allowed to do that and that's one of the things that held me back last year with the Inkscape project i didn't feel confident enough to run with that i didn't think i had the authority to run with that and yeah. i think that's something that perhaps we're not conveying to the community that if you've got something that you're passionate about and you want to do for Inkscape, come on board and do it. Yeah. And, you know, ask for help because there's, there's a, like you guys, yeah. there's so much expertise in the team yeah. and people can help and jump in. But as a, as a group, as a project, we're not enabling people because whether we haven't thought of it or whether people don't ask for the help. 
It's a very common. It's a very common thing. Uh, this yeah. is something that happens in a lot of open source projects, um, where there are those who are uh, either created the pro project or who've been involved with it for a long time. And there's there's work over here that, that's about making the, the the software, and then there's this other work that goes on over here, which is community management. And uh, you know, we've been trying to get better at it because it is an interpersonal skill. It is a social skill. It's a thing that maybe nerds aren't great at. Um, but it's something that, you know, authority in Inkscape is kind of vested in the group. And as long as you're, as long as you do a, a quick foot check, you know, you're going to double check just quickly that you're not going to stand on anybody's toes. Uh, maybe send a message to the, the list that you think is the most relevant list. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do this. Not, not should I do this or could I do this or would it be allowed, allowable? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I'm going to do this. And then you can, then you can just check the temperature because if you get a whole bunch of emails going i wouldn't do that that's not a good idea then you can have a you can have a rethink uh not to say that's even then that's not to say you couldn't do a thing but it is it is a sort of way to to, to at least with people who've been around for maybe a year or more that that, that gives them a, a routine to be able to do um brand new things that maybe nobody else has ever considered it before yeah well, and I think speaking of the vectors, I think one way we can help is to get people, there is a little bit of, there is a contradiction in what we're saying. I've observed that we say, well, come in and do something. And the people that do something, um, they get the say, right? But there's also a lot of resistance to newcomers coming in and doing something. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so it's kind of this tightrope that I think new contributors walk where they, they don't want to get flamed, you know, but at the same time, they don't really have much say until people see that they're doing things. So it's tricky, but I'm hoping that with the vectors, at least that we can come up with a, at least a list of ideas of things that we need help with. Yeah, I think at a lot actually, of the time, it's, it's, sorry, right? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I think um, just um, building on what you were saying there, I think um, for me, my experience was I didn't have the historical knowledge of what had gone on before. So yeah. ideas that I present or uh, things that I want to do, I didn't know if people had tried those before. And um, I know it's getting better. The documentation is there. We're creating the issues and people can look through. But it's still really difficult to navigate around. And so we yeah. do need to find uh, a, perhaps a way of indexing um, GitLab better. Or <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't really yeah. understand it, but I still struggle. I, I tend to, this will sound stupid to you guys, but I tend to open a link that I've got bookmarked, which takes me to the issues, and then I can find things from there. If I just dive into the GitLab page, I have no idea where I am. I have no idea how to find things. Um, yeah, no, the, the GitLab homepage is not meant for that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's yeah, awesome GitLab's terrible it. for that. <laughs> I, I, someday, someday, may we find our own home. I, you know, <laughs> the, the main reason I think for um, using GitLab initially was, well, okay, so this is kind of the, the history, the, the um, uninteresting history of Inks, uh, the vectors, right? So I kind of... I, I don't want to take credit for starting it, but I think uh, Marin and Bren kind of pinged me. I posted something on one of the Inkscape forums. Um, and then they're like, oh, this is really interesting. Are you in interested in getting involved? And I think around then Martin got involved. And so we didn't really have, it, it was just really just shoestring figure this out. And, and I wanted to have a place that we could chat that wasn't IRC. Because IRC is, again, I don't think most developers realize how weird it is for somebody that hasn't been using it for 15 years. Yeah. Like it just, how do I, it just, there are all these little secrets about, you know, the forward slash me, and then, you know, and you can make yourself talk in the third person kind of stuff. And it just, how do I, you know, register a handle and just, just real weird nuances, not that complicated, but just it's foreign. So. Anyhow, I'll, I'll talk faster. So I put fun. up Mattermost as an experiment to say, hey, is this a way that we can talk to each other that's a little bit more accessible? I was just putting that up on one of my own servers. And um, 
and I didn't want all of the most important stuff the project was doing on um, some server that I might, you know, throw in the fire and part with someday. And so I'm like, well, what, where do we have to conduct some of these other communications? At the mo at the time, it, we didn't have a, an official forum. We still don't really technically. Yeah. And so the thought was, well, it, that was about the same time that we the project was transitioning over to GitLab. I'm like, well, maybe we can make that work. <laughs> I, I think it's been good and terrible. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm starting to find my way around now. But, I mean, I've, I've been involved now for, what, 10 months? Moving on to 11 months? Yeah. yeah. And I'm only just starting to get comfortable with it. Yeah. Um, but that's because I come from a non-developer background. I mean, as I said before, I don't I don't do the tippy tappy stuff on the keyboard. Don't understand it. IRC frightens me to death. Never used it. Probably never will. Don't know how to use it. It's just for me that scary, scary nonsense stuff. GitLab was incredibly scary. Creating the first issue on there or project. Oh um, yeah, that was really scary. It was like I was scared to death that I was going to break someone else's work and I was going to delete stuff and it's really scary for someone that doesn't come from a developer type background people who are used to using git I mean I didn't even know what git was uh, I still struggle to understand what that was um, and so, we're not using any of that we're basically taking a big tool a Swiss army knife do you guys have Swiss Army knives over in the UK? Yeah. Or is yeah. that some novelty? Of, okay. okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure if that's some American, like, we'll pretend this is Swiss and sell a bunch of these pocket knives. But, you know, GitLab's kind of this Swiss Army knife of tools primarily targeted to developers, and we're just taking one of the tools and we're using it the wrong way. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like, yes. I mean, so the the advantage to the Inkscape project is that you have a centralized location where you can, at the very least, do things like task management. Yeah. Um, and we could do some sort of sort of active roll call, so we know we can sort of get a gauge on who the active participants are and uh, the, yeah. uh, back into like who they are. Um, if you were to use things like Matamost or other tools, uh, the project itself would have more difficulty getting getting into what it is. Yeah, um, and that's just that's just an administrative concern, right? It's got not, it's not really to do with how you would use the tool, or and this is why I think you may have been um, guided into using Git, GitLab for the project. Um, my own personal position is that if you want to use some other tool for communication, then you should do that. Um, if there's a better task management system out there, I would still hesitate to move away from Git, GitLab for that specifically, um, just because just because of the, the 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 price of disintegration is so high compared to integration. Uh, we've seen it with other tools as we've tried to to use them and add them into the mix. Um, things just kind of like spin out of the project, um, and so you. My experience says that we should try at least to try and keep stuff in. But as you were saying, Tim, about about experience and um, yeah. there being no documentation and, and fear about deleting things that you're not supposed to and stuff like that, this is a this is a wayfinding mission for people who are not developers. Uh, I mean, developers too have to find their way, right? They, these tools are fairly new, actually, in the in the developer landscape. But good documentation really can't be written by developers. Um, so what we need is for the like the first few entrepreneurs, the first few wayfinders who beat beat a path and manage to find a way to make issues and do things, to create those new documents that say, hey, it's okay, you can sign up here, log in with Google or Facebook or whatever it allows you to do, and then create an issue and don't worry about having to do, uh, do you know, whether you'll hurt the project or create noise or, or do anything like that because that it's it's actually okay, right? We we set up policies to try and minimize the amount of damage that any random per person could do, uh, while being uh, inviting to any to anybody, uh, even if we've never seen, seen them before, to be able to contribute to the project. Yeah, so I've I've just made a note there um, to have a look at creating a, a very basic, simple how to with GitLab. From my experience, I'm not go I'm not going to know all the ins and outs, and I'll I'll need to pull on the advice of other people. But I've, I can share my experience 
these are mistakes I made. This is how I overcame it. This is what I do to create an issue, you know, so I can do that yeah. and then pull in the experience of other people. Cause I'm still, is it markup language for doing yep. yeah. Mark Markdown. Markdown, yeah, that's markdown. it. Yeah. Markdown. Yeah. Uh, markdown, I think it's a pun on markup. Oh, right. It okay. Is. <laughs> yeah. Just... Mark markdown is a type of markup. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm still struggling with that. So it, it's a, it's a, it's a programmer joke. <laughs> Yeah. It's like GNU. It's like what's GNU stand for? Well, GNU is not Unix. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like it's just this recursive, and... recursive meaning. And PHP, I think, has had something. Well, no, PHP was personal home page, right? And then so, you, so the the, fun, the the funny one that I always get, I always get a laugh out of is uh, on the Linux command line. There's a tool called Less, and uh -huh. um, it's it's more powerful than the, the Windows DOS command more. So the Windows DOS plan is more. So of course, the, the joke is less is more. <laughs> yeah, OK. That is funny, actually. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, Tim, of how do you want to start this? Um, what, do you want to do a, a, like a dry run or break it down into section? I, I'm recording now, so. Um, I can stop Maybe recording in a second. We can we can record. Don't stop any recordings. Right. We just we just go for that's a my law. Cut. That's my law of filming. Right, Never okay. turn the camera off. <laughs> you know. In, <laughs> but uh, I mean, yeah, I won't go there. I I was just going to make some like political references, but like, no, we won't go there. Um, the do you want me like it to sing an intro song? If you I'm want, <laughs> no, I'm not going to. I'm not even going to fake it. Like, oh, that that, oh, that oh, might make it say? in here. <laughs> I was like, okay. Oh, there we go. Just, you just have it recorded. Just <laughs> extract that little excerpt. Stick it in the front end. Yeah, we're gonna use. We're gonna use that. <laughs> That's why you never stop recording. Um, Ryan, do you want to do an introduction? I mean, I know I put down for me to do it, but I was just trying to share stuff out. But I think well, you Tim, you come across really I, well I, on the microphone. Well, so do you. And I, this is uh, your brainchild, and I don't want to take any credit for it. So why don't you start us out and, and set up kind of what we're doing and why we're doing it, and then I'll jump in and yeah, talk too okay. long about my topics. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind. Um, I just, you know, I want everyone to to feel comfortable in what they're doing. Um, obviously, you guys are, in my opinion, key in the project. You know more about what's going on than I do. So, in my knobby little mind, I was thinking, well, I'm just going to come across as like the user community, sort of asking you guys questions. What's happening with this? What's going on with that? Because I can't talk knowledgeably about stuff that I've not been involved in. Whereas you guys, like you both went to the Hackfest, so you've got inside knowledge of that. Are you, you know? going to go to the one in Kiel? I, I, I would love to, but I can. Uh, if, if you ever come back to, to England, then yeah, I would definitely be turning up and I'll be banging down the door. Um, but yeah, I couldn't get across to Germany, not at the moment. Where, where, where about are you, Tim? I'm in Bristol. Okay. Yeah, I'm currently in. I'm currently in uh, in Witness. Oh right. So I'm not. I'm not actually in the, in the US right now. What? <laughs> Did we finally kick you out? No. <laughs> I've, I've got. Um... I sent. I sent ICE after you. I, I called their tip line. I said, "There's this <laughs> foreign national living in Boston." You know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they came and they were like, oh, look, he, he's valid to, to, to be here. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I've got, right. I've, got, I've, got, I've got problems getting around. I don't, I don't look it, but I'm, uh, I'm disabled. I've got problems walking, so getting around is a bit difficult for me. But if it's in the UK, then, yeah, I, I, will, be, uh, I will be getting there, definitely. I, I hope we do one in the UK. Yeah, that'd you be know, good. Frankly, this is off topic, as everything we've talked about thus far has been, but I would like to see a day where we have fewer, well, not that we necessarily need to have fewer large hack fests, but that we have more small hack fests in more places. 
like even if it's a two or three day, kind of like we did with the LGM, mm -hmm. the Libra Graphics Meeting Hack Fest, where you know there's an event and there's enough interest from people that are contributing to kind of set up a, a, a mini kind of hack fest meetup. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Even if it's like a think tank, you know, people come along and share ideas and um, get a community to come along and, and chip in their ideas because we're not going to think about everything. I mean, over on the Facebook group, right. the ideas that come out there, you know, it's just amazing. And the things that people produce is stuff that I would never think of doing or, or wanting to do. And that this goes back to what we were saying earlier. People have never had a platform like this. When somebody watches this video that we put out, there's the comment section, and they're going to be saying, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Why can't you do this? Why don't we have that? And it's going to be stuff that we've never heard of before. And that's, that's the opportunity for us to take on board what those people want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, we, we, we have an awkward... Um relationship with with what, what are known as wish list items hmm. so there's a there's a very large long list of things that inkscape could do and unfortunately um we don't have the programmatic economic power to deliver them all um yeah. we can be we can be uh, as volunteers we we have a, enough enthusiasm to be able to develop some of them and really, that's about mostly. It's about uh, how good the idea is. So, if the idea is really well developed, and the user has gone to town on developing like mockups and really diving into like how you would use this thing and how it fits into the SVG spec and how it would do all this stuff, that is something that you can you can really get your teeth into, and it's inspiring because you're now you're now collaborating. You're now working with the, the, the user. The user is actually not no longer a user; they're actually collaborating. Um, and the other the other alternative is that you develop a, a, a relationship. So if there's somebody who you know and who you've been talking with for many years and then and then they turn around and say, oh, you know, I'd love to be able to do this or do this feature. And the feature isn't that hard to do. That's also inspiring, right? Because you can be pushed into it. Yeah. But when it comes to like raw economic power, we don't have a lot of it. I mean, we, we, we're talking about hours on the side for a lot of developers who, are, who have jobs, other jobs and who do work on Inkscape. And, you know, it's really nice to be able to deliver to users, but I really hope the users understand the fact that it is a lot of volunteers and we don't have the time. Um, it's not really about time. It's actually more about, about just economic time to be able to develop a, a lot of the stuff that we would like to be able to do. Um, and hopefully, like, all of the, all of the uh, mulling over that we've been doing about how to improve the project's finances and how to improve the project's um, sort of, like, uh, economic um, strength is, is is about getting things like donations in, uh, inviting users to participate in ways that they didn't before, so that we can start to improve that. Um, if there's a situation where we can copy Blender, for instance, who has I think I believe four full-time employees or at least four part-time employees, I mean that that is a, a step up. It's a next level of being able to actually commit to being able to deliver features and deliver on uh, certain schedules and things that. Uh, the Inkscape pro project currently can't do because it's all it's all promissory right now. We 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 promise we'll be able to deliver a version in the future, but there are actually are no guarantees on 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 a time scale. Mm. Yeah, I I wonder sometimes if people do understand it. It's all voluntary work. Because I know, um, possibly from my own point of view, a few years ago, you you know it's open source, and you know you get it for free. But in the back of your mind, you just think everything like this is a big project coming from a big company with unlimited funds. And it's, why can't I have this feature? Why aren't you creating this for me? And it's not because people don't understand. It's because you don't actually give it any thought. You know? Yeah. And, and it's, not, it's not because they're being nasty or, or ridiculous or anything. It's just that people don't. They're used to things like Microsoft and Apple and big companies, and they're they're just not used to the smaller open source projects. They just assume everyone's the same. I think Ryan and briefly explain about vectors, um, all of us to discuss, and then we can sh 
show the um, website. Um, I've got the vectors page up now. So, Ryan, did you want to briefly outline vectors? It's basically, sell it, selling it to the community. So, if people want to get involved, why should they look at vectors? Okay. Well, um, glad to meet the universe, and uh, I uh, the vectors was basically. Um, the product of a bunch of people who wanted to help Inkscape but didn't really have the development experience to do anything and so it's kind of um, a group of people from varying backgrounds some are just all of us are Inkscape users some are like Tim here who are illustrators um, I come from more of a graphic design kind of background other people are um, don't really they enjoy using Inkscape maybe not would be hard to categorize their um, experience a lot of them are it, I guess I'm not being very eloquent here but basically Inkscape Vectors is for everyone who wants to contribute in promoting and helping Inkscape um, that maybe can't contribute on code so so, so basically it's a, it's a team of people that aren't necessarily developers who come together to work on projects to better Inkscape, to promote Inkscape, to evangelize Inkscape, if you like, that mm -hmm. type of thing. Is it, that that was the, uh, the 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 idea behind vectors? Is that right? Yeah, and that's much better said. And <laughs> and if you're a developer, you're welcome to join Inkscape. It's not really a a non-developers club. Um, it's just there are a lot of people that want to help that don't know how. So yeah. our, our mission is we try to keep the scope of our mission as narrow as we can, but even at that it's still relatively broad, which is basically to do the work that's necessary to make more people aware of Inkscape and that they can use it. And we do, on a limited basis, it's not really part of maybe the formal charter but we do provide some feedback to developers in terms of usability and features um, more as a consequence of being involved and and being a community of people using it in different ways but really the formal role of our team i think is to help people know that it's awesome and um so that crosses over into social media some of the other community platforms like the forum deviant art um, that also crosses over into the content creation for the website and some of the design of collateral to promote Inkscape offline and online. So at the moment, the Vectors team is is fairly new. It's, it's so probably just coming up to a year that the team has been around and it's been a learning curve for everyone involved. So how, how can we make it easy for people to join the Vectors team? What what should somebody do if they wanted to join? They've got an idea, they want to do something to promote Inkscape or they, they've got a project that they want to do and they want to run with it and they want some backup from from other people to perhaps help with ideas or help you know make that project happen. How do they join Vectors? What is the best course? So um, we'll post a link on this video um, which is basically the Teams page on Inkscape.org. Yeah, right um, here. Now, at the very top of that page is a little explanation of the team, and um, there's some links. Right now, um, you can join that team by being a registered user on Inkscape. It's open to join there, but we won't really it, we won't really know what your intentions are or anything at that point. If you want to let us know what ideas you have. Then there are two other links. Um, one is to GitLab, and one is to uh, Mattermost, an yeah. instance of Mattermost. So Mattermost is kind of a chat. It's like it's like the commercial application Slack. Um, that's kind of an experiment that we've been running for a few months. The other is GitLab. Now GitLab is people have probably heard of GitHub. GitLab is a more free and open source equivalent to GitHub. Um, it's primarily designed for developers, and so we're 
using it in an unconventional way that can be confusing to people. But basically, um, you can register a free Git GitLab account and then navigate to the issues within our team. And those links are all on that page. Yeah, I'm just trying to explain so it. So think of an issue like a topic. Um, in development, in, it would be an issue with a program. In our case, it's an issue with something that needs to be done or an issue with some idea. And that's how, that's how we track what we're doing. And there is um, a particular issue on there that's kind of a come and introduce yourself issue. So go to that page, read everything I said, um, study for the test, and uh, if you pass, then you can talk to us. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It, it is a little complicated, and we're working on that. Yeah. But th that is one way to <laughs> introduce yourself. If that all seems all really daunting, um, if you want to join the emailing list, you can probably catch a few of, us, few of us on there, and we can kind of guide you in on where else you might be able to join. Well, the, the, other, the other thing, we've got the, the comment section below. If someone is really new to this type of thing, doesn't understand yeah. what they're doing, put a comment below. Let us know you want to get involved. The other way is um, come and say hi on the Facebook group. Inkscape, yeah. draw freely. I'm one of the administrators on the group. Come and say hi to me, um, mm -hmm. and I can help um, get you over onto GitLab. Um, so yeah, there, the there's, we are, as, as Ron said, we are working on ways of making it easier for people to join the team. It's not ideal at the moment, but we're working on it. And that might be something that you could help out with. So yeah, um, yeah it's all about people coming along and contributing what they can do. So yeah, we're, we're not brilliant at everything, but we're r brilliant at some things. <laughs> But, yeah, we need we need help. So, Martin, you wanted to say something just now. Uh, yeah, so I I, uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, GitLab is what uh, the rest of the Inkscape project uses developmentally uh, to track things like tasks and issues. And uh, this is, this is not just main Inkscape code base, but things like um, their website, for instance, uses Git GitLab as well. And uh, hopefully we can learn a lot from each other about how we're organizing our issues and how we're inviting people to participate. Yeah, brilliant. brilliant. You've been doing a lot of work on the website, inkscape.org, at the moment. Is there anything that you can tell the community about what's going to be changing with the website? Is there anything that you can sort of uh, let us in on what you've been working on? Yeah, absolutely. So it, we're currently working on one of those things that if everything goes to plan, you should see absolutely no changes, uh, which is, unfortunately, sometimes you, you do have to do this kind of thing, where you uh, change a thing in the hopes of making it better for the future. And um, so what we're doing is we're grading the website from an older version, unsupported version of Django. Uh, hang on a second. <laughs> well, and I'll fill in the holes where he, he leaves off. Django is a content management system. Uh, basically, you, you probably have heard of WordPress. Yeah. Uh, Django is something like WordPress, but built for Python. And that's what uh, the website's built on. So I'm going to steal a sunder because uh, <laughs> he's answering the door. Um, oh, he is. oh, he's back. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, there was just some kids knocking on the door for my, for my daughter. Oh, you're okay. Um, I just told everyone what Django was. Oh great, great, yeah. So, so the the, the website is a Django-based uh, website, and uh, Django releases a new version every now and then, and uh, they they remove the support for pre previous ones. And so, if we want to maintain the security of the website, we have to keep this going of upgrading the the, the website. And um, because we've built so many nice things into the website, um, there's just a lot of testing and, and, and upgrading that has to happen. Now, in this particular case, I not only do I have to upgrade to Django 1.11, 1.11, but I also upgraded it to Python 3. So from Python 2.7 to Python 3.5, uh, which in introduced a whole boatload of mod mod modifications, syntax errors and things that had to be cleaned up. Uh, there's also a couple of uh, new style sheets from Mahela, who has contributed them to try and make the, the, the website work better on smaller screens, things like tablets. 
Uh, there's some rough edges, and so I'm reporting those issues back. And if anybody else sees any issues uh, to do with the way the, the, the website looks, um, then they should definitely report those because, um, you know, hopefully we can we can improve the style sheets enough that they work on everybody's computers. Um, but of course, we don't have all of the computers, so we can't know for sure if it's going to work or not. So, Martin, they would report those issues on GitLab? That's right. So, unfortunately, this is a, this is an instance where you can report them to you, on GitLab if you if you have an account and if you're confident enough. Uh, I, I encourage everybody to be confident enough, but I understand that it's it's not something that everybody wants to be involved in. So, if not, you can email me directly, and uh, we can post my email address in the in the com comments of this video, just in case if anybody you know has an issue. Uh, but most of the time, I think people are pretty good at posting issues. Um, but one of the things that I cottoned on to a while back that you were working on was the new gallery, the layout for the gallery. Is that something that you can talk about now? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the, 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 there's a new gallery uh, view, a new gallery CSS, which uh, wasn't actually developed by me. It was developed by uh, Javier. He's a, a Spanish contributor. And um, he, he's... The, the idea behind the con contribution is to increase the amount of space, the real estate in the gallery that is used by the actual artworks themselves. So we show off more of the artwork to, to people who, who are visiting the website. And uh, not only in the actual uh, list views, so for instance, increasing the amount, the way that, that the tiling works as all of the, the images are placed together, but also when you actually click on one of those and you zoom in and you see the full thing together, uh, that's still got a few kinks going on uh, because what happened was that we used the same style sheets in other places for in things like the Teams view. And so when he changed the galleries, he didn't take account of all of the other places in, in the website. And uh, so the, it, I, we need to talk to Javier and make sure that we can we don't lose that work that he's done because it is very nice and I'd love yeah. to be able to incorporate it. So am I right in saying that it was um, scalable across devices as well? So it looked the same on a, a desktop, a phone, and a tablet. Am I right in thinking that it was scalable? It, yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't look entirely the same, but it definitely looks, I mean, for the gallery views, it definitely looks better. Yeah, yeah that's really cool. Excellent. Is there anything else that you want to tell us about on the website? Um, anything that you particularly no. proud of that you've <laughs> that you worked well, on? Okay. So it's, it's actually a very uh, good training pl platform for myself uh, because of all of the, the work that we've put into mm. it. Um, I think uh, I like the, 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 the releases pages that, that we've managed to do now. Now, instead of ha having uh, uh, CMS pages, which are essentially uh, you know, blog, blog pages where we, we would put the uploads, now we actually have a releases app, and the releases app itself records every single release that we have, minor releases, major releases, uh, pre-releases, all of that good stuff. It's all in the database. So if you want to go and have a look, you can actually see the whole history of Inkscape, uh, who released it, what what it was in, and actually download really, really old versions of Inkscape if you want to. Cool. Yeah, that's excellent. Brilliant. Ryan, was there anything that you wanted to ask about the website? Uh, no, but it did bring up a couple items, if you don't mind me diverging from our path. Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. I just want to put in a plug, speaking of releases, um, there has been interest in helping us with a Mac OS release. Yeah. Um, our developer who was working on that um, kind of got pulled away for his work and hasn't been able to work on that. So it, the 092.3 release, I don't think exists yet for Mac OS. No. Um, so if somebody's interested in contributing to there, I think there is still a need, unless Martin, you know otherwise. Um, so you know, this, it, this is what I know. Um, somebody created a Mac OS X native release, which is actually fairly good. It gets us a long way towards having a Mac OS X release that you can at least be saying is average. Um, but the, the, the problem with it is is that because it was based on GTK2, we can't carry it forwards. I, I, tried, to, I tried to merge in as much of the work that they'd done as possible. 
um, but I just couldn't merge the majority of it because it just didn't fit anymore. So the best thing we can do is take the work that was done on that on that branch and take the ideas for how how it was done, and and then develop a native Mac release because it's not just it's not just about having a Mac release that works at all because you know we can push out an ex an exorg version of Inkscape for for Mac. Uh, but it's just no good. It's just not good enough. Uh, it, it's, if, if it was up to me, I would pull, I would pull the Mac, Mac release completely and say that we don't support it until until such times as we have developers who who can commit to actually packaging it, and not just pack packaging it somewhere else, but come into the project and 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 be welcomed in to uh, being able to to have the space to to develop the the modifications required, and not just release a native version of Inkscape for Mac. Yeah, I think that's really important, and that highlights the need for people to come on board and join, yeah. you know, and don't feel as though they're not necessarily worthy to join the team because the the team is full of just ordinary people. Uh, we were talking about this before the, the show, and I don't know whether we're going to show that, those clips, but um, <laughs> it was a real shocker for me to, to realize that people like Martin and Ryan and Tav all think of themselves as outside of the group. They don't think of themselves as key players in the group. And then someone like myself comes along. I'm just an ordinary member of the community. And, and I see these guys who are like rock stars. And I'm like, you're joking. You know, it's just, it's unreal. It's unreal. But everyone on the team doesn't feel as though they're a key player in the team. And that's because they're not. It's a team. You yeah. Know? And, and so anyone, anyone who wants to come along and help please come along and help we're desperate to get a mac build out you know yeah, um, absolutely in fact this this is what was happened in the past is that people have tried to join the team to, you know join the mailing list and, and and promote the idea that they could help with a mac release and then they've walked away and they've walked away because they've not felt welcomed and they've not felt like they had the authority to just take the reins for for, for a mac release and actually drive it yeah and and this is what I would say. I would say, look, if, if if there's nobody standing here saying, "I am the Mac Man," then you need to be able to have the the confidence to come to the pro project and say, "I'm going to help you with this Mac release," and you know, here are my credentials if if you think that's relevant, and here, like, where where, where do I set my down, down my tools, and what what you know, can somebody help me with this? Um, because we do need people to help with a macro, macro release just for, 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 the, for the project's health. Um, I'm a Linux user, a Mac release doesn't help me. But when I go to a, a lab that uses CNC machines or, or does artwork with kids for, for making t-shirts, for instance, and they, they've got Macs, uh, not having a Mac, Mac, Mac release really hurts me, right? Because I can't teach Inkscape in a way that I would love to, to, to be able to. And uh, the, the, the whole project has the, uh, lots of these little things where you, you would love to be able to do a thing uh, educationally or artistically, and you can't. You're stopped because of the platform that a per person is using. Yeah. yeah, I think that's really important. Yeah, and, I, and I would add to that, too, that you know, from my background, being in more of a professional design field, um, designers love Macs. <laughs> I, and I, I know why, because they haven't discovered Linux yet <laughs> <laughs> but you know there are a lot of we're, we're, it's it's in the progress or it's part of the progression towards Linux it's okay um, but there are a lot of I think really capable designers that might enjoy um, not being tied into some proprietary ecosystem for everything they do right that might enjoy uh, uh, Inkscape that I, I mean I don't want to overstate the issue that there is a a release that is available on the website. You can use Inkscape on a Mac, yeah. but it's it's kind of a it feels like a second class experience because of the roundabout way you have to go about using it. So it would be fantastic if there's somebody listening um, who does love shiny black and silver computers <laughs> and uh, also loves freedom. You know, come join us and uh, help us make a a native Mac OS release. Yeah, they, they don't actually have to live free from freedom. Uh, Despots are welcome to. The only thing they have to live is Inkscape and Mac together. Um, we, we got plenty of free freedom already. We keep that stuff on tap. So, yeah. yeah. 
So, anyway, thanks for letting me uh, steer us off course there, but the release topic made me think of that. And it does make me think of another item we were going to discuss, which is translations. Mm -hmm. And this yeah. is something that um, almost anyone can do. If you're listening to this, chances are you understand enough English. Um, well, if, if English isn't your native language and you're listening to us now, it could probably help us with translations. Ironically, some of the strongest um, communities of Inkscape users don't have um, a translation on the Inkscape website. I'm thinking of, um, in particular, Brazil. We don't have a very good Brazil Portuguese. And this is my understanding. If somebody is translating into Brazilian Portuguese and I'm talking down, pardon me. But my impression was that we don't have a very... Um, much of the content's not translated into Brazilian Portuguese. Much of it's not translated into um, Indonesian. Um, so, and I think even regular Spanish, which um, many of our users speak, we don't have a lot of translation support there. So, um, if you have skills and language skills and you don't know how to contribute otherwise, um, that's a great place to, to start. There is a mailing list um, we'll post a link to it. There's a mailing list for the translators group. And you can jump in and translate something, anything, and uh, help somebody else out in your own nati native country um, to understand how to use Inkscape. Yeah, one of the things I, I found out just the other day um, was one of the key areas that is important to be translated is the installer software. So yeah. it can be really difficult when you're trying to install a piece of software and it's in a, a foreign language. So just something as basic as that, if somebody could help translate the installation software into their native language, that would be a huge help. You know, if as long as you can get Inkscape onto someone's PC, then they can use it. Um, so it's not always about doing the big translation stuff. It can be as much or as little as you want to do. You don't have to get involved in the huge, great, big projects. You can come up on board and say, well, I can help out with that little bit, do that, and either stay or move on. It's not about having to be tied down to huge, great projects. It's just about helping where you can, when you can. And mm -hmm. things like the translation is, is perfect for that. You know, you can help as much or as little as you want. But yeah, drive, we, we call those drive-by drive contributions, hmm. and uh, they, they can be very important for a project. Uh, there's a long tail of contributors who, who have helped in Inkscape in small ways. Yeah. So that was one of the things I wanted to ask. Um, with regards to, to people who are involved in a project, let's say developers, how many key developers does Inkscape have at the moment? I'm talking about people who are... Um, consistently developing, not not people that come and go. At, at the present time, within the last year, uh, about eight, I'd say. Eight. So that's a really small team. That's a really yeah, and, 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 and almost all of them are, are part time. Yeah, yeah. So everyone's got daytime jobs. Nobody's working full time. There's no Inkscape employment business model. It's just everyone. Mm -hmm comes home from work, eats their evening meal, sits down behind the <laughs> keyboard yeah. and taps away for a few hours. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there, so some of us have, have obscure jobs that make it easier. For instance, I'm a con contractor. So I go away, I do a bit of work for Harvard, I do a bit of work for here and there, and then I come home at 2 p.m. and I do a bit of work for Inkscape. So it's not quite the same, but yeah, basically. Yeah. Well, Tam, that's one of the things that I find most fascinating about Inkscape is you think about the other tools that people are using, they're coming from corporations of, if not dozens, even at times hundreds and thousands of employees, right? And here you have this little project called Inkscape, and um, it, it manages to do so much of what these other applications are doing yeah. with so few people. And I think that that's a testament to the nature of open source, but I think it's also... Um, presents this really interesting um, draw to open source, which is if you come and you help, your impact is felt in, a, in an oversized way. Yeah. You know, 
yeah. you know, y- you might be a developer, and, and this is if there's any developers out there, you might be, be a developer on a really big team, and your contribution's important, um, but the impact on the overall is maybe not as felt as much um, because just the nature of what you're contributing to there. Whereas at projects like Inkscape, if you figure we have eight people, you know, we had one more developer who's got some good ideas and wants to pick up the code and run with it in a good direction. You know, the impact that can be felt there is just incredible. So, you know, it, 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 at once it's a, a, a tribute to what has been done, but also um, an invitation to come and help us do more. Yeah, I mean, I, I often feel that in the free software world that uh, developers, a lot of the time, the, the, the kindness that pulls out of them and the way in which they tackle problems that they see in the world, injustices, there's no, they're nothing short of, of, of her- heroes, right? They're, they're, they're heroically fighting for free freedom in a way that, I know it sounds cheesy, but they do work so that other people don't have to struggle and f- in frustration, and so they have computers that work for them and that they can own with confidence. And, and you know, this is partially what we have in Inkscape, is that our developers are kind, right? They're, they're working, yeah, sure, on their own behest and their, their own time skate schedules and so on, but a lot of the times they're helping users. Uh, they're developing things that they'll never use themselves. Um, you know, they're trying to put users first, even if that's hard, because there's no real extra motivation to do so. So, guys, earlier this year, you had a Hackfest in Boston, and that was hosted by Red Hat. Is that? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Red, Red Hat very kindly um, allowed us to, to host the Inkscape Hackfest uh, in their space. Uh, we held it just after the um, uh, Free Software Day that is held in Boston, so that there were pe- people around who could potentially come also to the event uh, and participate in the Inkscape ha- Hackfest. Uh, we had a really good time uh, and really good ter- turnout. Uh, we had lunches and trips out and i managed to get these guys lost on on uh dorchester heights so we had a big hike it was nice it was good like almost almost killed us (laughs) (laughs) he said oh sorry i'm going to i'm going to bring it up he said oh it's not that far away and about 35 40 minutes later walking across the entirety of boston we're thinking (laughs) what's not far away to you what where are you from? And then he's like, oh, it's just over this hill. <laughs> and another 30, 35 minutes. I, I don't remember how long we walked, but I know my legs are sore, and I'm thinking, it's true. people that live in Boston, they just like walking too much. I don't know what's wrong. I don't, I, so so the rest of the trip, everyone, every anytime Martin's like, oh, it's not that far away, we're like... How far away is it really? Like, what's the address? <laughs> We're looking this up on Google. It's true. We're, we're double checking the maps. <laughs> it's like, I don't trust your sense of distance or how hard of a walk this is. Hey, yeah. I got everybody really, really energized for, for the, the rest of the hack first. Yeah, it, it was good. Um, and, uh, yeah, so um, it, it was a fantastic trip. There, there. The nice thing was, I'd say to kind of dovetail on what um, Martin was talking about. You know, there was a lot of opportunity for the developers to meet each other and interact with each other and build um, bonds. And I think that's, it it wasn't, I I would not categorize this as a vacation by any means. I was really uh, beyond Martin's, um, you know, death march. Um, It was really fatiguing. There was a lot of work done. Um, but one of the nice takeaways was that everyone that was able to come was able to meet each other. Sometimes people had met each other before. For me, uh, as a first-time participant, I was able to put faces to names and to really talk to people in a way that you just can't really substitute yeah. online. And so that was really nice. Um, and, and I'm just incredibly grateful that for all the people that donated... So that could happen because I feel like everyone that was there, um, in- including some people that were there for the first time, some people that were more frequent contributors, everyone came away a little bit more committed um, to the project, a little bit more um, understanding of what each each of our contributions are, 
and 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 frankly, um, I think there were some really tangible um, improvements made to Inkscape itself, and Martin could maybe talk about that. Uh, yeah, so we 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 kicked off a uh, an improvement to the to the um, extensions. So we we're rewriting the whole of the the basis the the, the libraries for for the Inkscape extensions. They're based in Python. Uh, once again, we're waiting to Python three so that we can take advantage of the latest technology. So, Aaron, um, can I just ask a stupid question? Yep. When you upgrade to Python 3, does that affect the existing extensions, the ones that people can download from the website? Do those have to be upgraded too? Yeah, so a uh, very good question. Uh, and the answer is um, sometimes. And, and, and it may be the case that 80% of the extensions need to be tweaked uh, in order to make sure that they're compatible because there are there are ch changes to py Python 3 that made it uh, incompatible uh, with Python 2. But they're not extensive. They're not logical differences. It's just tiny little things that you need to, to be aware of. And also, the, a lot of the ch changes that were that were available to Python 3 were, were backported to 2.7 so that you could make those changes and not break compatibility with older Python versions as well. Um, so it is just a matter of something. There will be some cleanup, probably. Um, so I'm just going to interject here, because maybe not everyone knows what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> So we're talking about the extensions that you can add to Inkscape, right? Yeah. Yes. OK. So as Inkscape moves along, um, there's kind of a minimum. So Python is a scripting language that um, works within Inkscape, right? And what, basically, we have to kind of set some minimum level of a version of Python that the extensions need to meet. Um, the reason we want that minimum to increase is because the higher it goes, the cooler things we can do with Python. Um, but as we kind of move, progress along, some extensions that were written for an older version um, need to be updated. And there will be some syntax changes, some other changes that might break things. Is, am I articulating the issue well enough? Yes. Yeah, so the plan really is is that what we're going to try and do is is we're going to release uh, all of our in, all of the Inkscapes that, uh, all of the extensions that ship with Inkscape, they're going to be compatible with both two and three. So if you're running the Windows or or Mac, hopefully if that happens, uh, builds that'll probably still ship with Python two, um, but it'll, all of the extensions will work with Python three, right? So that's like the first goal. If you're running a Linux machine, then you'll have a Python interpreter already. And whichever one you have, Python 2 or 3, it shouldn't matter. Um, to the extent that you install extensions from somewhere else, if you're on a Linux machine, then there is going to have to be a little bit of uh, pro like modifications to make sure that they're compatible. But I think Linux users are the, us the users most likely to be able to uh, report issues to, the, to, to those developers and to poke them or even modify them themselves. Um, so hopefully there won't be too much disruption in terms of our, our, our users. So coming from a, a non-technical background, so the extensions, do you need the people who originally created those extensions to modify them, or is that something that the team can do? Or So if, if, um, if they're committed to our repository, then we're modifying them. Right. Um, if they're not committed to our repository, uh, then we can still submit a, a, a request to, to modify. So we can still modify them, but we can't ship them. We can just suggest modifications, essentially. Uh, or we can just notify them and say that the, the, the stuff needs to be modified. Um, it's up to the original developers, or because almost I think all Inkscape extensions are free software, uh, somebody else, a third part party, could come along and modify them anyway. Right, okay. So basically what I was getting at was they're not necessarily going to fall off the edge of the cliff. They just Somebody can come along and, and modify it. Right. Yeah, there are, there are certain extensions which I'm removing from the from the Inkscape pack, mostly because the, the, the dependencies are getting so old. Uh, there was a shell script which had been there for 10 years that was calling out to... Um, Another to another program, like it, it was an extension that didn't work on Win, Windows 
uh, or anything else but, but Linux in a very specific way. And I was like, this is not how we write extensions. This is not a quality extension that we really want to be shipping. So there, there, are, there are instances where we may have to develop a new extension to replace some functionality that we took away precisely because we, we wanted to maintain a, a quality bar. Yeah. Absolutely. And Martin, at, at the Hackfest, a lot of, at least part of what you you were doing was really tackling a lot of these extension issues as we march towards a 1.0 release and um, cleaning up kind of a library of a lot of extensions that may not even work, right? Right. In fact, we, we should probably talk about a bit about the decision to uh, move towards a 1.0 release. Mm -hmm. Um, because it wasn't a, a certain decision when we went into the Hackfest what the next release of Inkscape would look like. And uh, one of the concerns that we have is that because Inkscape itself has moved from uh, its toolkit, the, the, the thing that produces all the buttons and the graphics in the front end uh, is, is the GNOME toolkit, the GTK. It's moved from version 2 to version 3, which is a big change. And we, we've been preparing for this change for, for a few years now. And we feel like it's time now to make that shift so that the next version of Inkscape will definitely be GTK3. Um, but what this introduces is is the potential for a lot of disruption and also for a lot of um, you know small changes that need to happen. And so to give ourselves space and also to uh, drum up a more support for the next Inkscape release, uh, we want the next version of Inkscape to be 1.0. Finally, we're going to be releasing a 1.0 Inkscape release. And the idea is that we're going to have multiple uh, pre-releases that happen over a longer span of time than a typical release. And we, we really want people to test with those pre-releases so that we can get an idea of how stable the 1.0 will be. And then we'll be able to finally like put a stamp and say, this is it. This is Inkscape 1.0. 1, 1 so will those pre-releases be... Uh more stable than a, an average beta release or so would they be like daily drivers for people or would they be like used under an advisory that this could break um well unfortunately all inkscape releases should be used under the advisory that <laughs> this could break um yeah, i think no, there's no warranty but the the but you, you're, you're right so it's it should be the case that it is it is more stable than the average um, alpha or beta, um, right. but they should be considered to be staging in, su in, su in such that, imagine you were using you were using the, the, the latest cutting edge technology. You know that there's going to there might be a few hiccups. Yeah. So with that in mind, yeah, I, I think uh, the intention is to have two releases that are coexisting. So there will be the, still the 0.94 series, which will be more stable. And then we'll have the 1.0 alpha and the 1.0 beta. Alpha being good luck. I, I'm not sure what the terminology we'll end up using for that. I don't know if that's been said, but basically to eliminate confusion, um, we decided there was some discussion about whether we come out with a, a 0.95, but we try to tell people that that's the unstable um, version and 0.94 is the stable. Um, we, instead of trying to introduce that confusion, we just said we'll, we'll keep going with 0.94 um, as kind of the stable con continuation of things as they've been, and then we'll have these alpha and beta releases. I think Ryan, um, you mean you mean the the nine three release, right? Sorry, yeah. Magically go back and wherever I said 0.94, <laughs> I meant 0.93. Yeah, <laughs> I said 0.95, meant nine four. Yeah, sorry. Uh, but anyhow, the the point was. Um, 1.0 is what we'll feel confident that all of these changes over to G GTK3 are stable yep. um, and that you can use this without any greater fear of things exploding than they do currently. Yeah. And I, I found that of all the open source programs I use, um, Escape is pretty, pretty robust. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, I'm running it on a. Linux machine. I'm, I guess the experience may vary depending on people's. This, this, this is actually a great opportunity for anybody that wants to contribute to Inkscape because um, the the one point zero release will be a, something something that we will want to celebrate, and all contributors uh, will be celebrated. I think in, in in like how achieving this this milestone. Um, so it's going to be about stability and fixing bugs and all of those little 
paper cuts that we we have uh, in the pro project. Now is the time to get those in. Now now is the time to 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 like tweak that thing now. Yeah. And that's the other part. The other re reason for calling it 1.0 is uh, we do want to, people to feel like this is like a big moment, and we need help. Yeah. You know, come come test the beta. Learn how to submit a bug report if you haven't before. Um, give us a contribute a pull request if you know how to code. You know, and uh, we we want 1.0 to be the best release ever until 1.1 that's right and so that fable inkscape release that has the animation in it right <laughs> right oh well I'm... so speaking of animation <laughs> i'm just going to take that and run with a couple other cool features that were worked on during the inkscape hack fest that i got excited about one is variable fonts yeah, yeah. which is something uh you know it and i'm going to probably butcher it but I'll do my best to explain it. Basically, um, if you think of the way fonts work now, at least the way in, and I do a lot of web development, so the way I think of fonts is I have a font and then I have certain weights that have been pre-created um, for that font to give it just the right thickness that I want. Just so you know, Ryan, I'm sharing the, um, the web page um, oh, tabs perfect. Um, blog, so you actually, so I'm showing the um, Oh, weights. the visual? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so in a traditional kind of font, they're, they're designated weights, and depending on who built that typeface, there may be five, there may be a dozen, two dozen. Now, if, with a variable font, if it's coded, if it's built to be a variable font, and that's the caveat, this doesn't work on just any run-of-the-mill font, but it gives somebody the ability to create a typeface that has an infinite range of line weights. Um, it has all kinds of just really cool, and I, you know, you could probably, it t probably need to get Tav on here to talk more about that, but there, there's just basically, it gives you just a, a lot of creative potential with typography that is somewhat limiting right now. Um, and, and that ties in nicely with the second tab I've just brought up, which is again from Tav's blog. It shows um, a single line of text done in lots of different styles, so it's completely edited, and it looks amazing what what you can do. And am I right in thinking that this will all be done with sliders from within the Inkscape interface? So you you bring yeah. up the uh, the font editor within Inkscape, and then you'll have these sliders that you can move around and pull things about and change things and is that right is it... i think that's the intention yeah, yeah. um the, the interface is a little bit um a work in progress but i will say that that was one of the nice things of having um some non-developer contributors attending the hack fest yeah. um, was that um they're building out these interfaces and um like well how, how would you want it to be used <laughs> <laughs> you know and i think that's what people don't understand you know, it's just that um, because somebody has a lot of commitment to the project and a lot of development expertise, doesn't necessarily mean they know really what the end user has in mind. Um, yeah. And one other instance of this, I think that was valuable, and and maybe a plug for. I keep I feel like I keep asking for help with things, but I can always use more help. Yeah. Um, but one of the nice things about um, attending the Hackfest for me personally was um, there was some discussion at one point about uh, multi-page support in Inkscape. And um, a couple of the developers that were looking at it, they were looking at it like, well, because they use Inkscape for presentations, they were thinking of, well, how would multi-page support work if I wanted to make this into kind of a multi-page slide presentation? Yeah. And what I, by being there, I was able to explain, um, at least from my perspective as a designer, what we're looking for in terms of multi-page support. And, and it was completely different than what they had envisioned. Yeah. And so, um, open source only works when there's good communication, there's a willingness to kind of express ideas. And I think people are maybe intimidated to share what they're thinking. Um, but the reality is I, th I didn't feel for a moment from any of the developers that were there that um, the, these suggestions or these ideas or these perspectives were unwanted. Um, I think they were 
enthused to have somebody come around and take the time to say, you know what, this is actually the problem that I'm trying to solve with multi-page support, and this is maybe how this feature could help with that. Oh, we on multi-page support? Yeah, I was just explaining, you know, a little bit about multi-page support. I mean, that's a pretty early feature, but it's also kind of explaining um, the benefit of letting people know how you want things to work and being as explicit as you can about how it could work and, and even helping us understand the nature of the problem that you're trying to solve so that developers that are working on these features can actually solve the problem. Because they yeah, want to, they just don't, they can't get into your skin and see the world through your eyes and and understand how they can make your life easier. But this was actually a great session between me and Alex uh, because we had completely divergent views on how multi-page support should be done. And it is true that because SVG itself doesn't support uh, multi-pages, uh, the way in which we had to approach the problem, problem could have been many different ver variants, and, and each one of them has its own pros and cons. And um, I'll admit that I thought my ideas of how we should do multi-page support were awesome, and I went into that discussion <laughs> thinking, that's it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe how it should be done, and everybody's going to be like, yep, that's great, Mark, Mark, Martin, let's do that right now. And uh, no, Alex's ideas were, were, were better. Um, you know, he, he, we, we had a powwow, we explained exactly like what, what our positions were and pros and cons, and I had to concede it to him, his, his produced better results. So um, after that, we had a sit down about how, how to do design of the actual interface. But honestly, uh, once we once we have this call about how it should be done, uh, it, it, this we, what we mean by this is like how it should be saved into the file into the file for, format that guides the rest of the of the interface. That guides the how how buttons or what buttons is possible to present to users and how what fun functionality users can have access to. Yeah, one thing I would say is um, Ryan, you did some videos of the Hackfest in Boston. And if people have not watched those, they're on the channel. Go and watch them. There's so much information in there that we probably can't cover it now. <laughs> for yeah. one, but there's so much information. And one of the things that I picked up on was um, the, the new GUI interface that it's being planned. You know, and the fact that there might be one that's suitable for uh, youngsters at school, so a much more simplistic user interface for children to bring them into design, and then perhaps a more complicated one for professional users, and then you know all these different variants that the GTK3 will allow to happen. So check those out, and the variable fonts. I've just looked it up now. If, if you look at day four, and you go to 18 minutes and 53 seconds. There's a clip right at the end of the video, and is it Felipe managed to get the variable fonts working? Yeah. And yeah. it's just a few seconds long, but it's a proof of concept, and it's amazing. It's definitely worth worth looking. So that's day four, 18 minutes, 53 seconds. Go check it out. It's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> it really is. Um, so, Brian, the, what made you think to, to video the the hack fest i mean that that's something that never been done before was that something that you went there thinking that's what i want to do or did was it just an inspired idea when you were there what was what was what went through your mind well i think it started with a little bit more of an ambitious plan i i wanted to produce a complete video that documented how open source works and you know and when i got there it was just it was so busy um, that I didn't, I didn't end up having the time to produce something as elaborate as I wanted, yeah. but I felt like it was important at some level for people to see what's happening. Um, and I was coming into it because I didn't really, wasn't really actively contributing prior to a little over a, a year ago, and I, I would see the news post about the Hackfest, and I'd get like one or two pictures. Yeah. I had no idea what was happening. Yeah. And um, and I felt like, especially when I got there, if people were to, able to see a little bit more of what's happening here, this isn't a vacation for a few developers. This is a lot of work, It's and it's really useful, and good things are coming of it, that people would appreciate it, and they'd appreciate the people that made the sacrifices to be there. They'd appreciate the people that contributed 
uh, financially for people to be there and that they would get excited about all this happening because the the it, in the absence of communication people just assume the project isn't moving along that nothing's happening um, but when they actually see the inner workings and discover I've got s two people working on these this variable font problem I've got somebody over here working on this GTK problem I've got somebody working on the Python extension problem we've got people looking at infrastructure improvements and we've got people looking at other kind of peripheral things like the website and you know all of these people doing things um, I don't, it, it just creates a different sense for yeah. what's really going on behind the scenes behind those that cadence of releases that you know you see and just magically appear there's a lot of work a lot of people doing uh, fantastic things yeah it was brilliant I really enjoyed watching those and it, it was an eye-opener for me because obviously not being a developer I'm never gonna get to to go to a hack fest um, didn't know what it was. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. I, I will one day. One day. I'm going to crash. I'm going to get crash. Just around you, Tim. We, we, we will. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, that's how these hack tests work. Honestly, though, Tim, uh, you know, they start with somebody who has a connection who can help kind of sponsor it. And in Boston, you know, Martin did the legwork. And thanks to Morin, who works at Red Hat. She was able to kind of work with Martin and get that arranged. You know, Kiel is happening because um, Marin uh, in Germany um, yep. lives close by, and um, she was able to sponsor that. So maybe uh, what part of it, well, I don't know if you want to say it publicly on the Internet, but what part <laughs> of England are you from? The South. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe uh, we need to sponsor Hackfest down there Yeah. in your, yeah. Uh, in your living room. <laughs> and what a fest! <laughs> yeah. well, the yeah, the yeah. Wi-Fi is good, so that that'll be okay. There you go. <laughs> That's really all we need is a bunch of carbonated drinks and uh, some Wi-Fi. And uh, yeah, I can manage that <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so uh, you know, now that we've kind of brought it up, we do have a hack fest coming up. It's in northern Germany, if nobody knows where Kiel is. The very, very uh, northern, not the northernmost part, but pretty close. Um, uh, Martin, do you want to talk about that at all? I mean, I can talk to it. Uh, uh, I'm not the, the organizer. I wish that Marin was here to give a few words to you. Um, so it's the second Hackfest uh, in 2018, which should be pretty exciting um, because it's, this is a pretty... Uh, high temperament for, for like how many hackfests we're having um, but we know that um, our users appreciate us uh, developing Inkscape faster and being able to meet really does make it better uh, and easier for us to, to interact um, it looks like we're going to have a very large attendance list at this hackfest uh, if you go onto the Inkscape wiki page and have a look at the keel uh, Hackfest pages. There's there's a link there to the the attendees, and the attendees is is now getting to be a pretty big list. So and 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 there's lots of new new faces in that list too. So it'll be really exciting to to to, to meet everybody. Excellent. So and I'm just going to put another plug out there. Um, we'll have a button up on the website to donate. If you have a dollar, a pound, a euro. Um, Whatever currency you have, any any little bit helps. Um, and I can just say that um, the the benefit of these meetings with between developers and other contributors that are non-developers goes far beyond the Hackfest. It's it goes far beyond that four or five or seven days or whatever it is that these people are in the same room because it it kind of fuels the work that happens in between and the relationships that are built there and the projects that start there. Um, it's really, really important, and so we don't ask anyone to pay for Inkscape. We don't ask anyone to give more than they can afford. Um, if you can, if you can't afford much, if you can't afford anything, please continue to use it, and share it, and contribute back in different ways. Contribute back in translations or in just telling people about it. Yeah. If you can contribute a little, the money does help. If you can contribute a lot, 
we won't say no. Yeah. <laughs> well, we actually have a, a system on, on the website for contributors, businesses, for instance, who wish to uh, donate uh, large pots of money who um, can become gold, silver, or bronze spon sponsors. Uh, and th those pots of money really, really help because they're, they're, they're stabilizing. We, we, when we have large pots, we can uh, plan for things in, in the future. And if anyone has any question about where this money goes, um, usually it, it, nobody's paid directly to do work on the project. Uh, there may be some sponsored features that we introduce later where people can um, be compensated for their time. But as far as these hackfests are concerned, um, we're basically providing for people's expenses to be there. Yeah. Um, they're, they're taking their own time off of work. Um, in some, some instances, they're paying part of their own way. Um, you know, I mean, we had a couple people from Brazil that came up to the Boston Hackfest, and one of those guys came with great sacrifice to himself without any compensation. And so, um, you know, your donations do make a difference, and uh, that's kind of the yeah. nature of how they're spent. Hey, hey, Ryan, I mean, you got to stay, to stay with me. It was nice to have you over. Yeah, and, and I, I, was, I was, as a newer contributor, I uh, was in a, on a tighter budget, and I was able to stay in Martin's house and watch uh, um, the IT crowd. Yeah, that's right. You know, we watched the IT crowd together. <laughs> <laughs> the one night that we weren't too tired and <laughs> didn't go straight yes. to bed. <laughs> you know, actually, what, the, what, for me, I'd get back to the house and Martin would be uh, going back to interact with his family and I would conceal myself in my room and edit those videos. <laughs> yeah. Also, also good Wi-Fi, so that's, that's good that helped. Yeah, yeah. Just, just if I can add a few things, um, if you can't afford to donate anything, just create what you create with Inkscape. Share it online. Yeah. yeah. Put a hashtag Inkscape. Show the world what you can do with Inkscape. It will inspire someone else to use it, and that helps tremendously. Just getting the community built up. That's that's brilliant. It's not always about money, but if you do no. want to donate, it's really simple. And to my shame, I donated for the first time a couple of months ago. I'm really sorry, guys, but it was, I did. But it was so easy. I mean, literally, I clicked the button, PayPal did it all, did the currency conversion for me um, because the donation is in dollars. Uh, I didn't have to work anything out. I just put in the amount that I wanted to, click the button, it was done instantly i had a confirmation from paypal and i had a confirmation from um the the company that organized what's the name of the company that does the the money so we the inkscape is um operated by the uh software free freedom conservancy yeah uh, which is our which is our trademark and money operator they they essentially operate a bunch of free software and software pro projects and uh, we have legal counsel and all of the, the you know, the other structural things that you need to operate. I think that's important for people to know that it's not just somebody sitting in their back room, taking all the money in and going down to their local yeah. post office and yeah. putting it into a pro, you know, this is all done officially. It's all above board. Yeah. Uh, no one person can access the money. You know, your donations yeah. go to the team. And yeah, and in fact, the, the, the project is a, is a 5013C. So if you do donate to In In Inkscape, uh, you should be able to claim that back on your ta taxes if, if you're in the US. Yeah, it is a not-for-profit and it's the home of a lot of other recognizable projects. Um, of which I'm struggling. I'm afraid to say any because I'll probably get them wrong. But the Software Freedom Conservancy, um, if you go to their website, there's there are dozens of projects, many that you would recognize. So they provide. I guess don't don't worry. Um, Bryce isn't driving around with a Ferrari. Um, <laughs> it's all your donations. <laughs> yeah. Buying a pri private jet. Yeah, there's no Inkscape private jet floating yeah. around, you know. <laughs> you know, and I, I would say this too, you know, uh, I, I'm willing to bet that the vast majority of the work, the contributions that make Inkscape move forward are the con contributions of people's time and talent. Yeah. And uh, I, I think uh, um, nobody should feel, if, if they don't have the means to provide, um, if you can provide your time and your talents in some way, um, nothing is lost. So, and, and 
you know, and maybe kind of as a wrapper f for me personally, as far as uh, the Boston Hackfest was concerned, I came away really, one of the things I came away with, not just meeting people and building better relationships, but was re really a renewed commitment about how amazing Inkscape is as, a as part of kind of this open source idea that anyone in the world that can scrap together some hardware can use Inkscape. Anyone in the world can create. There's no subscription. There's nothing that keeps you from doing it. I mean, granted, you, you, you do have to scrap, have some computing hardware, but even at that, you don't need top of the line computing hardware. Bring your talents, use Inkscape, make the world around yourself better, cultivate the talents that you have. It's just really amazing that these people are all donating and that the reach of their time and donations goes so far into so many places. So for me, that was really kind of the n renewing benefit of participating there. Yeah, yeah, the Hackfest was really nice. And I'm, I'm really glad that you came, Ryan. Thank, thank you. I was glad to be there. <laughs> I'll just point out that we're posting an article about Scale, which is uh, the largest community organized Linux conference in the United States. Um, a couple of us were able to present there. There are some really cool presentations in kind of a new Libra graphics track. Um, and Inkscape was able to have a shared booth with uh, members of the GIMP team, which was kind of a cool thing. Um, so you'll be able to find that article on the website. As of recording right now, I, I don't think I've published it yet. So, <laughs> But by the time I get this edited and in live, um, that will be on the website. But and there was, a, all there was a video. There was a video of your talk, wasn't there, Ryan, at scale? Yeah, all of the... All the presentations um, were recorded. Mine was re had some technical difficulties, so the actual the recording that actually shows my slides is something that um, I think Mark put put together. Um, MC. Yep. And so there's a link to his kind of trying to piece together what I butchered by trying to work through some technical issues. We're not professional. But, uh, there's some. Yeah. <laughs> well. <laughs> I, I love open source, but you know, uh, you, you kind of make peace with the the occasional issue. It's just kind of it's a little endearing. In that case, it was I don't know what the bug was, but anyhow, there are recordings of all the presentations. There's some really fascinating ones there. Ted gave a really good presentation about SVG filters, and mine was more of a general discussion or um, presentation about the need, the the ways that we can get more um, professional creative types involved in using open source. Okay, I think we're probably through the agenda now, unless anyone can think of anything else. We probably should be. Yeah, <laughs> should, I think, yeah we should save things for, for later. I mean, But to be honest, I think what we've done is we've made it a really relaxed, just three guys talking, just bringing it up. And I think that's, to me, that's the way I envisaged it, not just a, a news at 10 sort of boom, 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 <laughs> knock out the news. You know, this is just us. We're, we're laughing. We're, we're having a chat. It shows the friendly side of open source and Inkscape. And I think that's, yeah. that's important. We just want the community to engage. If they just see us as three idiots chatting, they might find it amusing. They might, they might continue to watch. Yeah. But, you know, we're giving out a bit of news as well and we're having a laugh along the way. So. I think that's good. What what's the name of your, your adorable dog behind you, Tim? That's that's Rosie. That's my oldest daughter's dog. Um, oh. My my oldest is getting married at the end of the year, so they've gone off for their hen weekend this weekend. Right. So my wife, my youngest, my oldest, they've all gone, and so I, I'm dog sitting, and um, she won't leave my side. Everywhere I go, she's got to be there. So mm -hmm. she just follows me around. She's desperate to go playing with the ball in the back garden, and she's. She's getting fed up now. Her nose is twitchy and she wants to go for a run. Uh, Sorry, Rosie. We <laughs> took too long. Well, I, I will wrap it with this by saying um, this is a work in progress. Like everything that we're doing, it's a work in progress. And if anyone has, if there was anything that people liked about this episode, leave it in the comments. If there's anything that they hated about it, you can send them directly to Tim's email. 
<laughs> no, I like more or less, you know, your feedback is fantastic. So, but thanks. If you survive this long through this video, then yeah. uh, you win a gold star. Oh, and you can like, comment, and hit that dingy bell thing for notifications and stuff. Yes. Yep. Yeah. All that. All, right. All that good stuff. Well, goodbye, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.